We are the Whitney family. From our family to yours, welcome, welcome to Bethel Church, Church Online. Good morning. I'm Ben, and this is my wife, Sarah. We really miss seeing all of you. And we're so excited that you are joining with us for Bethel Church Online. Hey, Bethel family. We're Mark and Gabby Damascus. We hope you're all doing well and staying safe. We miss you all so much and hope to see you really soon. Welcome, welcome home. home. Hey guys, are you ready for some church? I'm Steve. And I'm Josie. And we're the Abruzzi's. And we sure do miss you. But now it's time for our Bethel online experience. We, we love, love you, you and, and welcome, welcome home. Good morning. We're the Cuevas's. I'm Daisy. I'm Jose. And I'm Becky. Welcome to Bethel Church Online. We miss you guys so much. Welcome home. Hello, it's the Bookers from our house to your house. Welcome to Bethel. We miss you guys. Well, bless the Lord, everyone. So glad that you could take some time to be with us here this morning. And uh, it's, again, good to know that we're coming to a, a conclusion of this particular season that we find ourselves in. And uh, we're all looking forward to getting back together again to some sense of normalcy. And uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't had the opportunity already, to go back and listen, even if it's just the first 10 minutes of our Wednesday night teaching, because I made an announcement concerning our plans as far as returning to in-person services. We, at this time, are not going to set a specific date but rather we're just going to take it day by day and just see how things move along. And on Wednesday night, I made that announcement and actually added a few particulars there. So again, I would encourage you to go on Wednesday night's teaching, even if it is, to listen to those first 10 minutes just to get an idea of how we're progressing here at Bethel Church. But also want to make an announcement here of something that's going to happen. We're really excited about this, but next Sunday afternoon, this would be June the 7th at four o'clock and six o'clock, we're going to actually host a drive-in worship service. And there'll be a one-hour service, and we are looking forward to this. We're asking you to drive your cars, and we're going to park you in our uh, parking lot, and we're just going to have a time of worship together. Now, we can only house about 60, 65 cars at a time, so we doubt that we're going to be able to get everybody here in one service. So that's why we're doing a four and a six, and it is a first come, first serve basis. So if you want to get to that four, you better get here early, um, or you can wait till the six, but it's just going to be a great time. We thought this would be a good morale booster so that we can at least see each other from the car and we can wave um, at each other. But there will be other details that are going to come out this week, so please make sure that you drop by you know, our various platforms and just kind of keep your yourself abreast of all the things that are going to develop, but just get that on your calendar right now. That's June the 7th at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. If it rains, we're going to move it to the 14th, but uh, we're just looking forward to a great time of worship together in Jesus' mighty name. That's all the announcements I have. Um, as you can tell, things are a little bit different here today. And uh, before we go into our time together, uh, I just want to say that uh, through the years, you've heard me at various times say that as a pastor, I have never felt the need to address every single issue that takes place um, at a state level, um, at a national level, or even an international level. Level, uh, Just never felt that I needed to do that. If I were to address every single issue that takes place, um, we'd never get to sermons for the perfecting of the saints. And so I have just 
had to pick and choose the events that I felt needed to be addressed in a message. But there are some events that take place on a local level, on a national level or, or an international level that have reached such uh, a feverish pitch that it has dominated the narrative and there is just no way of escaping it. You have to stand up and you have to address it. You, you have to say something about it. And there are times when even mentioning it in a message is not enough that you really need to spend some time really processing it with the believer. And uh, certainly that's what I feel today about the events that have taken place in the United States, uh, really stemming from the horrific events that went down this week in Minneapolis. Just a very tragic story. And as it even continues today to unfold, it has just broken our hearts and we grieve so deeply over it. And uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, a background here, Friday morning I got up early and I started just going over my notes and waiting on the Lord. Um, I knew the direction that I felt I was to go in and uh, started working through those thoughts. But I felt a check as I was going through those notes and as I was waiting on the Lord there was just something there a hesitation but I just kind of pressed through it and then I took a break and I got a cup of coffee and I sat down and turned on the news and I saw what had happened the night before and even into the early hours uh, of Friday morning in the city of Minneapolis and I, I just felt a check in my heart and I reached out to a dear brother and I just asked him, what are you thinking today? And we had a great conversation. And in the midst of that conver conversation, I felt a, a confirmation of what I should do. And that is just to lay aside the message I had prepared and just spend some time here today uh, talking and having a conversation about some of these events. You know, here we are again. Face, facing this racial tension and I just felt you know we need to talk um, and and not just hear a sermon but have a conversation and uh, so I've invited a couple of very special guests to be with us today and before we start this conversation I've spent a lot of time this weekend thinking about Daniel and and Daniel's role in various administrations, if you will. If you know the story of Daniel, it's an incredible story of how God raised him up to even speak to kings. And you may remember in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a terrifying dream that robs him of his sleep and troubles him throughout the night. When he wakes up the next day, it's hard to know whether he really could not remember the dream himself or he was testing the wise counselors that were around him. But he says to him, I don't want you just to give me the interpretation of my dream that's troubling me and keeping me awake every night. I want you to tell me what the dream was itself. And again, whether he forgot the dream or he's testing them, we're not really sure. But all of the experts around him said, you're asking us for the impossible. We can't do that. And he said, this is the edict, and if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you all. And of course, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, word comes to Daniel, because Daniel was one of those advisors himself. And Daniel went to the king and said, give me one evening with the Lord. And... Uh, and that night, God spoke to Daniel's heart and showed him what the dream was and, and the interpretation of the dream. And I love it. The next day, he comes to King Nebuchadnezzar, and King Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, what's going on? And I love these words. This is Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, 
the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. I love that. And, and I believe that inasmuch as the same spirit that moved upon Daniel is upon the body of Christ, we should be able to speak to the issues that keep the politicians and the experts awake at night and keep them wondering what is going on. We should be able to say, this is what is happening. And this is what God is saying has to be done if there is going to be change and transformation. And I believe that the answer to racial reconciliation does not rest in the hands of politicians and experts. It lies in the hand of the body of Christ, ordained by the Spirit of God to speak in this hour in Jesus' mighty name. And so with that, we're just going to have a great conversation. And I have two wonderful friends that I haven't seen in a very long time. But uh, Sister D. Wilson and Brother George Johnson are here. We have had a lot of conversations through the years about these issues. And I am so thankful that they could be here with us today. And, uh, you know, I just asked them if they would take a moment to kind of give you a little bio of their life. And uh, Sister D., thank you for being here. Give us a little bit of uh, your journey. A little bit of my journey. Well, um, I was born in Philadelphia. I'm a lady, so I'm not going to tell you the year. <laughs> but um, I'll definitely say it was before Kennedy was president. How about that? Wow. So um, my dad moved us from Philadelphia because, you know, the city was just not safe for us. So he moved us unbeknowingly to Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And at that time... Um, we were the only black family. So it wow. was interesting. We went from being in the heart of our comfort zone to like, where are we? And no one could basically prepare that. So I grew up in Cherry Hill, um, you know, graduated through the system. And through the years, Cherry Hill was good to us. But the beginning years um, were not. And I guess, you know, I, we can talk about that with the other question because I could. <laughs> lead, lead on with some of the things yeah. that we endured in those early years. But um, we landed out here, you know, I grew up, you know, I bought in Lawnside and then we landed out here in Gloucester Township and we've been living out here about, here's more of the, the years, 30 years. Wow. Now. So, but we've experienced things out here as well. So what mm. we're talking about hasn't gone away. Mm. If I can lead in to that. Okay. It's still here, whatever yeah. this issue is. How long have you been coming to Bethel? Oh, boy. And this is the story. 9-11, um, 2001. Uh, we attended another church, but I was working that day. And this gets emotional for me because it, it really hits home, 9-11. Um, I watched on someone's television as the planes hit the first tower, hmm. knowing, thinking it was just an accident. And then we watched a few minutes later, the plane hit the second tower. And I froze and I was working and people said, what's going on? I said, my brother works in those towers. And we were thinking, you know, it's, it's an accident, right? It's gotta be an accident. And then we stop and we're learning that it's not an accident, right? And then a few minutes later, we watch the tower go down. And immediately we're trying to call my brother and we can't reach him. We can't reach him. And all we know is that the towers are down. And um, to us, that was a day that the earth stood still for our entire family. You know, my kids were in school. They were at Lewis. One was at Lewis, and they were locked down, so they couldn't get out, right? So we couldn't reach one kid. Um, 
The other one hadn't gone to Highland yet, which she was six when she was home, but we were worried. But we didn't, we didn't know. And um, through the day, we, for me, I always wanted, a, I needed to find a place. People don't think that having a place of worship is important. And we understand that God is in us, but I needed to lay across somebody's altar that day. Praise God. And there were no open churches, none. We rode, we drove, and everybody was fearful and afraid. And I rode and rode all day into the evening. And I came down Blackwood Clementon Road. And I saw that there were cars in the parking lot. And we went in. And all we know, all I remember, is prayer and worship and people lamenting before the Lord, where the tears, no one knew my struggle at the point until we were called to the altar in the end of the service that day. And I shared that story that we don't know where my brother is. We don't know. And if I can remember anything about this pastor who's colorless to me, I told him, I, I don't know what color you are. You're just a child <laughs> of the most high God. But all I heard from him is this, God knows everything. He knows everything. Just keep praying. Amen. You're going to hear something. And by the time, it was almost like um, the man who went before Jesus when his servant was sick. While we were driving home, as we were driving home, we got a call from his wife saying, I heard from him through the email. He's fine. My Praise God. Fine. So I've been coming, needless to say, to a church that laments and worship, worships the God that I serve and can get a prayer through. Praise God. When needed. Praise God. God is good. Brother George, give us a little idea of your journey. Um, my name is George Johnson, and uh, I was born in uh, the city of Camden, um, and I spent uh, half my childhood there. Uh, the other half was in uh, Newark, Delaware, which is a, a total contrast to uh, the city of Camden. Um, I was born um, when Kennedy was president. <laughs> um, and um, originally, um, I recall growing up in Camden when we used to leave the doors unlocked, leave your bikes outside, um, screens were open, you went to your neighbor's house across the street, their doors were open, uh, your buddy's bikes were outside. And um, so things were good uh, for the most part. Um, but there was a shift that took place. And um, we, we did leave Camden and uh, moved to Delaware. Um, in the city of Camden, uh, it was predominantly um, minority. It was either, um, it was blacks, Hispanics, and uh, a few Caucasians. Um, but um, when we moved to Delaware, um, the contrast was was extremely uh, different. Um, I was the minority. Um, there was very few um, blacks in uh, Newark um, when I was uh, a preteen, and um, there were even fewer uh, Hispanics. Um, the majority was uh, Caucasian Americans, and um, it was fine with the kids, but we had difficulties with adults. And what I mean by that is this, um, my first experience of racism um, at its finest was when um, myself and uh, four of my friends, um, it was in the summer, I was about 12 years old. Um, we were just, we were having a great summer day and we had, uh, we swam at the pool, We played at um, the creek for a bit, did a little fishing. Um, I mean, it, it was almost Mayberry style. Um, 
And while we were walking, we had to cross a highway, Kirkwood Highway. We had to cross the highway and I don't even remember what we said, but we were all cracking up over something that was said or, or we did or what have you. And at that very moment, someone rode past um, and I still remember the color of the vehicle. Um, it was a beat up um, gold um, older vehicle, not well maintained. And they intentionally and purposefully wound their window down and said, end lover to my friends. And we just all, and, and they kept on riding. Again, it was by the highway and they yelled it and it pierced all of us. So it was five of us and we were walking and it made each and every one of us feel extremely uncomfortable. We didn't know what to say. We didn't know what to do. Um, I didn't know what to say. And they didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to say to me. They didn't know rather to comfort me or ignore what was said. And I didn't know rather to blow it off and just tell them it didn't bother me or um, make fun of the guys that just said what they said. We just didn't know how to handle it. And um, we then began to walk. And then I began to feel angry that these people who did not even know my friends made them feel extremely uncomfortable and likewise made me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just the beginning. <laughs> that was the beginning of um, many, many incidences uh, throughout the years. Wow. George, how long have you and Carolyn been coming to Bethel? Uh, Carolyn and I have been here for um, um, about nine years, almost ten. Wow. And uh, what you had mentioned about the, the shift in the congregation, we were eyewitnesses to that. Um, when we first started um, coming, uh, it was just a handful of uh, minorities here. And then I still can't figure out what happened. <laughs> um, it just, all of a sudden, the congregation, the size began to, to blossom. Um, and every nationality you can imagine began to flood the, the gates of the, the, the doors. And um, we, we were just in awe that this was occurring. Yeah. And uh, we, we know it was the Lord. It obviously was the Lord. Um, but it's been that way ever since. And it kind of gives you a taste of what heaven is going to be like. Praise God. I, uh, I had never even thought that you both were eyewitnesses to that too. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because, I mean, it was a few years ago, Kathy, my wife, she, uh, she keeps all of our church records and stuff. And, and I'll never forget the day she came into my office and she said, when I filled out, we do an annual report for the Assemblies of God. And she said, I don't know if you're aware of it, but this year we we crossed that threshold where we are no longer a ma majority uh, of one color but we we are now a, a fully integrated congregation mm -hmm. and that is just exciting and and i remember uh, a couple of conversations i had with pastors they would say to me what, what did you do? What was your strategy? I mean, just tell us, you know, what focus is and what, and I said, I just preached the word, man. <laughs> I, I said, what do you want me to tell you? I, I, I didn't do this. This is the doing of the Lord. This is the work of the Father. And I, I'm just so, I was thinking about it last night. Of all the things that I have witnessed here over the last nearly 25 years, that I can be excited about. There is nothing that excites me more than, than God has given us a diverse congregation mm -hmm. and peace within that diversity as well. Mm -hmm. um, we got a lot to talk about. We, we, we took a half an hour just with that. So we got to move here a little bit quicker, but let's get right down to this, okay? You all saw what happened this week in, in Minneapolis. And uh, 
you know, I had mentioned that I had talked to somebody um, Friday morning, and it was Brother George. You were the first one I called. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked George, but I, I'd like to for you to expound on it. Um, when you turned on the television, when you heard on the radio, I'm not sure how you became aware of what had happened in Minneapolis, first with the senseless murder mm. of George Floyd, but then all of the, um, the, the demonstrations that started, from what I can see, started peaceably mm. and then quickly escalated into rioting. What went through your mind about the slaying of, of George Floyd, but then also of you know, the, the demonstrations that turned violent. What went through your mind? What were you thinking? And Dee, I, I, I'm always going to start with a lady, but Dee, what was in, was in your heart? Well, it's interesting because um, I try not to watch the news that much mm. with all that's going on, but my children called me. And um, it was my oldest daughter who said, Mom, it happened again. And I'm like, what happened again? And she told me the story. She said, you've got to see it. So I looked. And I'm going to tell you that um, it happened again is what resonated with me. Why does it keep happening again? And it's not the fact that people don't know, because people do know. Yeah. We all know right from wrong. Um, I know I'll say it later, but it's not every police officer. It's not every, quote, white person. I know as a Christian, it is a condition of the heart. And you don't harbor um, that resentment or whatever it is, you're supposed to let it go. But it's just like sin. At what point does it stop? Yeah. So I asked myself with all of the voices going in and I talked to the Lord about this and I said, I don't understand it. I said, I lived through it with my, hearing the stories from my dad who had a brother that was poisoned by a Caucasian because she didn't want him to walk on her property. I personally lived through the experience because that's what comes up when it happens again, right? Um, when we moved to Cherry Hill the Caucasian person next door put up a fence. And it's similar to just like George said, kids don't know it. So you're not born with this. <laughs> you're taught this, right? Yeah. And all the kids tried to do was try, they were so excited that there were kids next door. But the dad put up a barrier so that we would like kind of talk to each other through the fence. But what we dealt with because we were and this is what comes up. The neighbor across the street had a German shepherd dog. She set her dog free on us so that we couldn't come out of her yard. So my dad put a fence around our house to try to protect us because, you know, we, we didn't see it in Philadelphia. When you're around your own, your own kind, right? And I think that's it, you know, it's, it's the it's a blatant unawareness when you're around your own kind, be you're white or you're black. It isn't until you're faced with that nasty, whatever it is, racism. Yeah. But with my brother, and I don't know if I shared this story, we were playing kickball on our patio and there was a neighbor to the left of us. She had a dog. She put her dog that faced our side of the property where my dad didn't get the fence. My brother went to get the ball, and the dog jumped and ripped his eye out. Ripped his eye out. Now, when you're about eight years old, and you have to pick up your brother, 
and he's screaming and you literally are holding his eye, which is hanging out. You don't, you don't understand that. Like yeah. all we thought at the time, it's a vicious dog. However, there was a police officer on our street who knew it was more than that, who came down at that time. And he happened to be Caucasian, hmm. blonde haired, blue eyed Dave, that's what we call him. <laughs> consoled us because we didn't, we didn't know the enormity of all this, but treated us, held us, cried with us wow. as children, right? He was a police officer. He was a police officer because he didn't see color. He saw humanity. Humanity, this is what this is all about. And I don't want to monopolize this because there are more stories. There are stories of being spat on, spit in my hair on a bus a school bus, if I got on it, yeah. right? That happened to us. N-word was so common that we thought it was our name. We, my dad would put us in front of the mirror and tell us who we were every night hmm. because we were faced with what people thought we were. But we grew from that, we did. But I, I said to myself, and I prayed to the Lord, I said, how do you get people to understand? What is the issue? here at hand. And I heard many, many of my friends say, I don't understand what it is to be black. This is wrong, but I don't understand what this is to be black. And it came to me on the very same day that I came to Bethel on September 11, 2011, when we were hit with a terrorist attack that all of us in America felt the same thing. We wow. felt violated. We felt attacked. We didn't feel safe, right? All of us felt that. So for people to say, I don't understand what it feels to be black, think about September 11th when we were attacked of our security right. and all of that. So it's, a, it's an awareness and an understanding. But what September 11th did it did more than attack us. It gave us resolve. And I'm not getting political, but I did you know, read some excerpts of Bush who made us feel confident because he took a stand to get us to not be fearful anymore. Why? Because he went to the enemy. He went to the root cause of it. But that took time. But in the meantime, when the towers went down, and we were attacked. There were people on flight 93 that wasn't gonna let the enemy hmm. take the rest of the people down. Right. And that's what came to me last night. It was Thomas Burnett Jr. and Todd Beamer at the time when they saw that the enemy that was gonna destroy who we were, they weren't gonna let it happen. So they took action. Yeah. The problem is no one's taking any action. It's good. So it continues to happen again. Yeah, sad. What about you, George? What was, what was on your mind as you're watching all of those events unfold? Um, uh, just like Sister D said, um, first thing I said is, oh no, not again. Um, just um, last year, we had the two incidents of the, uh, the young um, entrepreneurs in Starbucks mm -hmm. being arrested for basically having a meeting, which I personally have had multiple meetings in Starbucks and everybody else does too, but for that to occur, that was just uh, uncalled for. And then um, we just had um, the uh, young lady that was, uh, I mean, just riddled with bullets um, in her own apartment um, uh, back in March. And then uh, how about the bird watcher who, mm. if it, I mean, if you can, I, I thought about this. Um, he was literally doing what he, he does, um, but because his outer shell was of a darker pigmentation, it was uh, perceived as something negative and wrong. And he had no control or say so in that at all. He just was doing what he does. And um, if you can literally take out and it's posted on all, all types of social media. 
if you can literally take out the video and just listen to the 911 call that the lady portrayed over the phone, you would definitely, if you, if you were a police officer and you caught that man, he would be arrested and convicted. And no matter what he said, he would not, would not have gotten away with it. Um, she was better than some of the Hollywood actors in the way she conveyed how terrified she was. Yet the camera was rolling. And so when you put it all together as a whole picture, you see that it was just blatantly um, an injustice. And, um, and she paid for it. They fired her from, from her job, which that gives me, that gives all of us um, a, a glimmer of hope. You don't want revenge, but you want to see that um, it's, some people just will not tolerate it. You want justice. You, you want justice, but um, I'm always remember what the scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, yeah. I will repay. And um, just, <laughs> it, it may not be the vengeance that you seek because God is so merciful and so just. Um, Jonah f found that out. Uh, he knew before he even went through his journey, he knew God was merciful. Mm -hmm. And he, just like he didn't want to um, um, give Nineveh a warning so that they would repent mm -hmm. and turn from their ways, Nineveh was horrible. Um, and they were, he, he was prejudiced, to be honest. Jonah, a, a man of God, was prejudiced. So it does happen even in the church. Um, and, and I won't say rightfully so, but justifiably so, um, from some of the atrocities, just like Nineveh, there was many atrocities, and that's why he didn't want them to be let off the hook. Sure. Um, same thing, you can go over even further back into Exodus. There was uh, prejudice um, um, even then um, with um, the Hebrews and the Egyptians. Um, so it is not something new even in the Bible. And of course, you have the, the woman, uh, the Samaritan woman. Um, Jesus dealt with um, um, prejudice all the time. Um, the woman at the well. But uh, getting back into the present, um, not only the, the bird watcher, I remember uh, just recently the jogger in Atlanta, he was shot and killed by an ex-police officer uh, or former police officer, I should say, and his son. And then of course, this happens with uh, George Floyd. And right away, I, I, I just said, oh no, not again. <laughs> George, let me ask you this, um, and again, I don't want to belabor this one particular point because these are sensitive, raw things, but specifically now, because I, I get that, but how do you feel when you see, again, whether I'm a protester or not, I believe in the right to protest. And there's, I, that's just a constitutional right, um, but then it escalates and it becomes violent and there's fires and just all this that is going on. How did, what goes through your mind when you see that specifically? Um, just yesterday, um, a very dear uh, bishop friend of ours uh, from Philadelphia, um, Carolyn heard something that he had said um, um, on one of the medias and um, he said, we cannot allow culture to trump Christ. Wow. And, and he was disturbed, just as I was too, that many saints are saying that they're, it's, almost, it's, it's almost saying that this is justifiable, mm -hmm. it's understandable, um, that this was inevitable. Um, and almost like this is what everybody gets because you've ignored um, the issue for so long. Um, but we cannot use scripture to justify a sin. You can't fight fire with fire when it comes to righteousness. You can't fight sin with sin. Uh, you can't fight wrong with wrong. Um, right. Jesus had righteous indignation we ought to have 
righteous indignation when things are wrong. Uh, but we need not to cross over the hurdle or, or the, the threshold of going into <clears throat> sin itself. Right. Um, protesting is a um, constitutional right in America, so therefore we can protest. Um, we can uh, change things um, when we talk to our leaders. Um, we can um, do many things that are legal but when we start doing illegal things to uh, um, justify um, um, the means of uh, what we're dealing with, right. that we've crossed the line that we need not to cross. God is not pleased when we're setting Walmarts on fire, police departments on fire, um, grocery stores on fire. Why would you set a grocery store on fire? You got to eat. Um, but at the same time, and, and I'm not, I don't claim to be the, the uh, representative of um, the entire black community. It is, this is just my personal sure. uh, experience and opinions, um, but I do side um, more on the, uh, the Bible's view of how things ought to be done. And um, though I understand, because I've personally had to deal with this, um, I remember a time, and there's a number of occasions, I just gave you the one that was the initial one that I, I recall that was really, um, I still remember it to this day, 12 years old, and I'm in my 50s, 50s. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember just being on a bus. I, I'm on my way to college. I'm working two jobs, and I see an old, Caucasian woman look me in the eyes and then clench her purse. And I'm saying to myself, lady, I'm probably the only person on this bus that would protect you as a stranger. And here you are guarding yourself from me. I don't, it, sometimes it, it doesn't even make logical sense. Sad. Yeah, it's sad. But that's what we deal with. It's a good perspective. And, you know, again, not belaboring the point, but, you know, I, again, just by nature, I'm not a, a protester. Mm -hmm. Not not saying that I wouldn't if the, the occasion, you know, I just felt it needed that. Um, but again, I, I have no problem. I, I think it's a constitutional right. And I, I believe that they, it should be protected that there are peaceful demonstrations. And D, your dad, marched with yeah. Martin Luther King. Yes, he did. He marched with Martin Luther King. And again, growing up in that era, we saw the protests. You know, my dad went to the March on Washington, and I shared that with you, and my kids know, because he's shared that with them, that the day that he told us he was going, he had four children at the time, and he said, there's a good possibility I might not come back. And we didn't know what that, you know, like, what does that mean until, you know, we really started seeing the fallout of the I have a dream um, era. But from that, we took our lead from our dad that we know we have, to, I'm of an advocate, you have to make a stand. But the pen is mightier than the sword. Yeah. Not being violent goes a whole lot further than to be violent. And, you know, there was another speech that Martin Luther did because rioting would happen when he was marching. And the issue is that we need to look at our history, that we're only destroying ourselves when we do that. It's like George said, you gotta be able to get groceries the next day. You've gotta be able to go right. to the store the next day. And it reminded me of what happened with the fallout in Camden. The same thing happened to Camden. Camden was a viable mecca of businesses until there was a riot. Wow. And Camden has never recovered from that. Never. Sad. And that's what we have to look at. Let's look at the means in which we do want to change. The change doesn't come by rioting and, loot and looting. Right. The change comes from changing the heart of people. And the only ones that can do that are the ones that 
by the by the Christians. Praise God. We're the ones that are yeah, called to amen. do that. Amen. Um, I think it's interesting to note too, is, is that something that is often overlooked, as far as you know these these riots that become violent and in some cases deadly, is that a lot of it is not being stirred up by the citizens black or white or any other um, ethnicity it's not typically them that are doing it they're bussing in there are you know factions you know far uh, you know in this case far left uh, mm -hmm. wing groups that are bussing people in they want this to be fueled up yes. And, and so it's not the citizens that are destroying their city. It's people from other places that want to keep this going. I think that that is important mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times we just think it's people that live there that are doing this. And that may be true in some cases, yeah. but not all. Um, but I just want to add this and it because I, I, I'm glad of what you had said. Um, but I, I also want to just throw this out too because it's one of the concerns that I've had through the years, and I had shared this both with you um, when we were talking uh, before, that it always seems that when something like this happens, it doesn't always happen, but it just seems like mm -hmm. this is always a case, that when there has been violence committed against a minority, whatever it might be, but typically it is within the black community, when there is a violent act that then leads to a demonstration but then it starts getting out of hand and it turns violent and it turns um you know just burning houses and cars and and now it's in multiple cities that it's going on in this particular case it seems that the narrative always goes over there mm -hmm. and then and what we'll say is i know that this act what this officer did was wrong but this is wrong too and all of a sudden there's a shift and what what i just want to challenge um, those on the other side of this issue is to not be distracted mm -hmm. no one including you 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 despise the rioting you despise, I've had an, and I, I'm, I know I'm not adding to your words because you've shared that with me. You despise it, and rightfully so. But let's not get so distracted that we forget that there is a 46 year old man who lost his life mm -hmm. to, to, to a, a, a criminal police officer. Mm -hmm. And, and we love our we love our law enforcement. We do. And he is just one bad apple, okay? But he sat on that man's neck for five minutes. Mm -hmm. While even while even his comrades were saying, You need to let up. Let his life be taken. And that's what I'm saying is I've got to make sure in my heart that my outrage for that is at least equal to the outrage I have of the violence that ensues in the, the riot. And I never allow that to become a distraction. I've got to make sure that I, though I can say this is wrong and it's, and it needs to be, um, it needs to be charged and, and people need to be held accountable for it. But I'm not going to lose sight of this. A great injustice was done and I have a responsibility as a child of God, I mandated in Scripture to make sure that that is not a distraction. But I remember, hey, um, we're not tolerating this mm -hmm. at all. I liked your illustration a moment ago um, uh, about the Flight 93. Mm -hmm. You know, it can only prevail if good people do nothing. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we've just got to be able to say, this is yes the writing's wrong mm -hmm. but this is wrong too mm -hmm. and i'm not going to be distracted what am i doing to make sure that people are being held accountable Absolutely. 
and that's that would be my challenge out mm -hmm. of this. Listen, I, I need to make a turn here. We're running a little bit longer than I wanted to, but um, listen, I've known you for years, both of you for years, and um, you are friends. I have never detected even a, a, a hint mm -hmm. of racism within your heart. But hearing your conversation, I know that that just didn't happen. You had to work through mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. And I'm just curious if you both would just take a moment and just who is your mentor? Who is it that came alongside of you as a young lady, as a young man, or even older? You know, who is it that came and helped you navigate? Um, racism on your part and I I know that's a touchy issue but you know racism is something that anybody can experience and hatred towards another race who helped you who uh, mentored you and helped you work through the pain and the hurt mm -hmm. so that you can come to a church where you have a white pastor <laughs> you know, and love him just as a, as you would anyone else. What helped you with that? Who, who was your mentor? And maybe just again, a moment, but what did they say that really helped you in those, in those issues? Well, if you're going to start with me, I always, I was so blessed to have a fantastic dad. I miss him. So <laughs> I miss him. So our whole family, misses him so he he grew up you know in that time you know with segregation and he he tried his best to shield us from it but it, it comes in any way and we tried our best to shield our children from it and I think what hurts me the most is I do say my dad's words you know, you're a child of the Most High God, right? Mm -hmm. You look in that mirror, you're made in the image and likeness of God, regardless of what Praise anybody it. tells you, you know? And you can, you can say that and say that and say that. And we, you know, as a family, we got over, you know, we, made, we came to terms, you know, with things in people, right? You know? Jesus said himself after we come off of the Easter season, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I tell that to my granddaughter all the time. Anytime somebody does something like really outlandish, they can't have Christ in them. You know, you've got to forgive them. But when you see the fear again, right? And this is again because we've had this conversation before. And um, this time I have a grandson, right? So when I see a Floyd being killed, that was somebody's baby, right? When I look at, I looked at him and I said, man, that mother didn't know at age four that she'd be burying her son simply because somebody wouldn't let him breathe, right? So I, I worry, right? I still listen to my dad. He, he, he's in my mind. He's in... He's in my heart, he, you know, and the Lord Jesus Christ is there. But I worry. I worry because my son-in-law has to drive at night. He works night shift. I can't tell you how many times the police have pulled him over for no reason. And we worry, you know, will he say the wrong thing? You know, will, will we sometimes see him again? I have a son in Atlanta. Wow. I worry with him in Atlanta with what happened. Mm -hmm. I worry. I worry with my husband. And not because there aren't good people. It's the people that I can't control. Exactly. Right? There are good people. There are really good people. But until we take that action, right? Till we do something, those that are in position, and they're not the people of color. I'm sorry to say, it's got to be the people that are not of that are not being effective, that has to take the action. We can't do anything right. with it. But the other person that influenced me was my first boss, 
she, Dr. Laskin, she was a Holocaust survivor. She actually wow. showed me her numbers. Wow. She came from Germany. She lost all of her family in a concentration camp. And I remember struggling because, you know, not everybody could get into a nursing program uh, because I was, I will say it to the school that I went to, someone told me I could never be a nurse because of the color of my skin. Wow. Really? But she told me this. She said, let me tell you something. Find another way. Because what you get in here, no one can take that from you. Amen. You can go far. You'll always go far. So between the things that my dad said and the things that she say, I keep that focus. But I can't control that man or woman who stops my son, who stops my son-in-law, and who could potentially stop sure. my grandson. That's good. George. Um, the, um, there, were, there were multiple people who were influential in my life um, that um, kept me on the straight and narrow, if, if you will. Um, first, um, on my mother's side, um, there's a strong African-American history. Um, Pastor, you and I have talked about this uh, briefly before. Um, I am the uh, great, great, great grandson of Dr. William Still, who was um, the architect for the Underground Railroad. And um, just recent, I think it was last year, the movie Harriet came out. Mm -hmm. And um, he was probably the co-star of, of the movie itself um, because he and Harriet Tubman worked together closely um, to free slaves from the South to bring them up, up to the North. Um, he was a philanthropist and uh, an abolitionist. Um, so that was ingrained in me from birth um, to um, seek justice and what was right according to the word of God. Um, and on my father's side um, is European. So um, I was born um, with two views <laughs> of life, period. Um, though many people, unless I tell you, you won't know that, but some, many people just judge me by, again, the color of my skin. Um, but there were other people uh, along the way, like I had teachers um, that literally helped me to um, become colorblind. Um, so not colorblind physically, but colorblind spiritually. Um, so that I would, I personally would judge people by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. So whether you were um, um, Filipino, um, um, Jamaican, um, Irish, it, it didn't matter. Um, if you were nice, you were, you were nice and you just so happened to be Irish. Or if you were nasty, you were nasty. <laughs> you just so happened to be um, Asian. Right. But they had nothing to do with you being nasty. You're just nasty. <laughs> and you're also just nice because you're nice. So um, I have no problem being friends with those who um, want to be friends. I don't, there's no barrier, um, no color barrier um, that I see. I don't, I don't judge a person by um, the color of their hair because I have blonde hair, blue eyed, blood relatives. So <laughs> and I remember um, one early incident, um, my mom, I mean, I was a, before my double digits, <laughs> as the kids would say. Um, I, I think it was around the time when Alex Haley's Roots miniseries came out. And so that stirred up a lot of um, 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 Emotion. emotions and, and scars even that uh, kids have, have seen, uh, teenagers have seen, and even adults have seen. And I said something um, in the house. I, I mean, I wasn't even thinking, and I, I was so young, but it was something that I got from school 
and um, it, it was a derogatory statement towards European people and a uh, European descent um, people. And my mom said, what did you say? And she was in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> she was in the kitchen and I, I just came home from school and I just went about my routine and blah, blah, having a conversation with her. And she was doing something. I don't remember if she was cooking or she was doing dishes or whatever, but she stopped instantly and said, what did you just say? And she said it in that tone where I knew I was in big <laughs> trouble. And now I'm replaying in my head, what in the world did I just say? That? That's getting ready to get me crushed. <laughs> and um, she said, she turned to me, I mean, just stopped everything she was doing, turned to me and said, don't you ever let me hear you say something like that again. Wow. To hate anybody that's not your race is to hate yourself. And I never forgot wow. that. I never forgot that. I never said it again either because I didn't want my block knocked off. But <laughs> <laughs> I never forgot that. And to this day, it's, it rings true because a person that hates another nationality, you're really hating yourself. Um, and Pastor, you and I were even talking about this um, yesterday. Um, there's three brothers that we, this whole planet is descendants of, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. That's right. So, I mean, to hate your, another person is really to hate your own self, to hate your own family. So, um, and I've had police officers, Caucasian police officers, Asian police officers that treated um, um, kids as if they, they were colorblind too. They could care less. They just wanted the kids to grow up and do well. Um, and then, of course, the number one um, influencer in my life um, who made sure that all of those lessons stuck and was purposed in my life and to be passed on to my kids and to my kids' kids was none other than Jesus Christ himself. Praise the Lord. Lord, he was colorblind although he was colorful, <laughs> <laughs> Amen. but he was a perfect blend of it all because he is the creator of all mankind. And he too saw men as though they were just his creation, men. He didn't categorize them. Only those who loved him was, the, and that's how we were created. We Praise were created God. to love him. And so the, the real key and the whole um, drive in my life is love. And so love overrides hate. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the world respond to atrocities. And that's why it escalates so easily from daytime protests into nighttime riots, because it's the world that's driving this. It's not the believer. And if the believer is following that, then the believer needs to check their motive, motives behind it and see, are you following the world or your experiences, or are you following the way of the cross? Because right. God tells us, uh, I believe it's in Matthew 45, uh, 44, um, to bless those that curse us um, and, and those who spitefully use us and, and persecute us. Um, so it's the opposite of what you would instinctively want to do um, to be um, driven and tempered by the Holy Spirit, you have to um, go against what you naturally would even want to do. And that is to fight back um, because of the pain and the suffering that you may have experienced, but that's not the way of the cross. That's not the, not the way of Christ. Christ tells us how we are supposed to fight back. And the number one thing that I don't hear a lot of people saying is we need to pray. Hmm. Now, I hear pockets of it. I hear you saying it. I heard a bishop saying it. I heard some um, uh, other pastor friends of mine saying it. But for the majority, I don't hear a lot of people saying we need to pray. Praise God. <sighs> There's just so many things. And, and we could keep this conversation going on for so long. Um, 
you know, I, I was I was thinking about this last night, and I I'm thinking about it even now, that just what we're doing right now would if we would all do that mm -hmm. it would go a long way mm -hmm. to healing this um and that is sitting down and asking questions mm -hmm. and being willing to listen without the need to jump in and have a counterpoint mm -hmm. and have you can like I, I just mm -hmm. i I have learned through the years that I can gain um, greater inroads into someone's life if I'm just willing to sit mm -hmm. and ask questions mm -hmm. and just hear without feeling that I got to defend mm -hmm. my position, just to listen. Even if I don't always agree with everything that's being said, it's that willingness to hold back and just ponder those things in my heart. Just to, just the simple things like, you know, we, I, I was listening to an interview sometime over the last couple of days and, and you know, there's things you don't, or that you just take for granted. I never once sat with my son or my daughter when I, because I taught them how to drive and went with them when they went for their driver's exams and everything. It's just something as a dad I looked forward to. Never did I ever sit down with my son or my daughter and say, if you get pulled over by a police officer, mm -hmm. this is what you have mm -hmm. to do. You know, th this is where you're supposed to put your hands. Do I never had to do that. Both of you had yeah. to have that conversation with your kids. Yeah. And, and like, that's just something we don't consider, mm -hmm. you know? And again, you, you know, you're not worried about the whole, you're worried about the one or two, about the few. you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's what I'm saying is, I just think that everybody has got to cool their jets a little bit, mm -hmm. has got to stop thinking white, black, mm -hmm. Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, and just say, I'm going to listen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to process these things. And I'm going to, I, I want to ask questions. When I first, you know, like I, I've told you, my first black friend did not show up in my life until I was 19 years old. I grew up in Northern Maine <laughs> and any exposure that I had to any nationality, you know, uh, other than, you know, um, our, our roots more were in England, you know, up in, in, uh, uh, in Northern Maine at that time, um, any exposure was like from the trucking industry. And at the time I was growing up, it was, uh, an air force base up there, Loring air force base, but I never had a conversation until I was 19, my first year in Bible college, Ivanhoe Ellis, we called him Joe. And I love Joe. And he was so patient with me because I just didn't know. But he didn't, he didn't condemn me for saying things that I probably shouldn't have said, but he just realized he, he's not a racist. He just doesn't know any better. And he worked with me, you know. When I first came here to Bethel, I had a very dear... Uh, black brother, Harold Sutton. And, and uh, I just said, I don't know anything about the black cu culture. So when I ask you questions, don't feel that I'm mm -hmm. being racist. I don't know. And he patiently worked with me and just helped me to understand. And that's all I would plead and 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 the and it's the other way as well. It's not just, um, you know, your your one group. It's not just the whites trying to understand blacks or the blacks trying to understand the Hispanics. Or it's not that. It's all of us mm -hmm. being willing. Tell me what it's like to be in your shoes. Mm -hmm. Just Jesus asked a lot of questions to get down to the heart of man.
and we need to be asking questions. Mm -hmm. I, like I said, we could just go on and on here. And Pastor, uh, can I just please, say one please, thing yeah. before you close? Um, with all of this, we can't forget that it's never been a black white thing. It's just, it's a humanity. It's the nature of the fallenness of man. That's good. But if I, if I can tell the world anything, what moved me the most in all of this, and I shared this with you, was the song by that young black boy, Keaton Bryant. And he said a lot of things, you know, that resonated with us. But the, the last thing that he said was in that song was, I just want to live. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus came so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. That's all we want. That's all that anybody wants. That's all I want for my grandson. That's all I want for my son-in-law. That's Amen. all I want for my son. That's all I want for my husband and my, my granddaughter. That one girl who was riddled with bullets, this could happen to any of, it could happen to me. I was pulled over in front of my house in Gloucester Township. I've been a resident for years. So it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And all I want to do is live. Yeah. And we all do. We all do. Amen. Praise God. George, you want to? Yeah. Um, Pastor, um, you made a valid point and a distinction um, with your um, upbringing. Um, when you're not exposed to um, different minorities, that is just not knowing or ignorance, if you will. The difference between ignorance and um, hatred is crystal clear. Um, putting a knee on the neck of an individual that's begging you in authority to, to do everything in that circle right there. The only person that really could help and he's pleading for that person to help them and they're not helping them. That's not ignorance of a nationality. That's hatred. hatred. And so that is what needs to be persecuted. Um, and I noticed, and I was watching um, the protesting in the daytime because you can see the color of everyone's skin in the daytime. There's more um, majorities um, that are protesting that of what has taken place on a daily basis than there is minorities there. And, and I also see that there are more young people there. So I'm, I'm under the impression that there is a lot of ignorance in those crowds. But at the same time, there's a lot of foolish youthfulness in those crowds so that it escalates quickly. And um, what you were saying about just being able to ask questions, there needs to be more questions asked. And there also needs to be more patience of those who are Praise being God. asked so that um, those questions can be answered and be answered correctly, not out of pain, mm -hmm. not out of suffering, not out of hurt, or, or as we say in um, um, the classes that we have, hurts, habits, or hangups, not out of that. We want to literally answer based on truth so that the person can use that as you have from the gentleman that you met in Maine and um, um, the brother that was here when you first came. Their influence is influencing you properly and it's also clicking with your spirit properly. So when right is coupled with right, right comes Praise to pass. God. Yeah, amen. You know, I uh, was sharing with Dee and George before um, we came onto the camera that uh, it, it's just interesting how, you know, 
over these last 10 years in particular that um, we've just seen an explosion of diversity here. And by the way, I love that. And I would never want to go back. I love, you know, I was thinking, imagine looking at a painting with no color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it's color that makes a painting living. And I, I'm thankful for the, the, the diversity that the Lord has brought and the flavor and the culture that it's brought. And, and what I, I may be even more blown away of, other than the fact that we have such a diverse congregation, but we have lived through a number of very uh, racially charged mm -hmm. events you know, from elections to shootings to riots. We've lived through them all, and we haven't missed a beat. Mm -hmm. Like, it, to me, that's just amazing that it has never come to, to a, a divisive moment here at Bethel. And it's just, I, and I, I love that because I think in the back of our minds, we just think, we're all coming to dad's house on Sunday, so we better learn to get along. And, and so there's just that sense we gotta, we got to get over this. And we come back and we worship together, and we're reminded we have one dad. Amen. And that is Father God. Um, and I think that that may be what was my concern in this particular event and why I felt I needed to have you with me today. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have that. Because of this coronavirus, mm -hmm. we're not able to get together. And I just said, you know what? I'm not going to tackle this alone. I want you to be with me mm -hmm. so that we can remind all of you at Bethel, we're one family. Amen. We are one family. And that's the one thing we've said through this whole thing. And let's make it abundantly clear. We all agree on this, mm -hmm. that any racial reconciliation and healing that is going to happen in this country is not going to come from Washington, D.C., it's not going to come from the hands of lawmakers. <laughs> it's going to come at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who shed his blood one time for all mankind. He didn't die and rise again in Jerusalem to save the Jews. He didn't die and rise again in Rome to save the Romans. He didn't die and rise again in Greece to, to save the Greeks. He died once for all mankind Amen. Amen. in Jesus' name. And that's why I'm going to close with this. In Galatians, it says in chapter 3, verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Amen. Jesus. Amen. And his point there was not that there was not differences. That, that wasn't his point. His point was that as far as God is concerned, there is no partiality. He loves us all Amen. as his children because we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know, one of the, the, the side effects that has come out of um, this coronavirus is that uh, we're all forgetting what day it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we all look around and say, what day is it, you know? And I, I made a major blunder last Sunday because it just kind of, I, I lost track of the days and stuff and I erroneously stated that last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. And of course, Pentecost Sunday this is Sunday. this Sunday. <laughs> and, uh, you know, George, you were the one that said, technically, Every Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, you know, but today is technically uh, Pentecost Sunday. And, uh, and it's just, a, again, a reminder that the Holy Spirit, Peter stood up and said, on, in these last days, he has poured out his spirit on all flesh. And to take away no doubt, uh, and to take away all doubt, um, in chapter 10, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the, horse, uh, the house of Cornelius. Yeah. 
and, uh, and the Gentiles. And, and we know that there is no distinction in the eyes of the Lord. In the eyes of the Lord, we're all one. And, and that's why we just plead with everybody that the racial reconciliation that you look for, it can't be mandated. In fact, if laws taught us anything, the more laws you put on people, the more you awaken temptation to do the opposite. It is not by might, not by power. It is by the Spirit of God Amen. that there is healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for You're taking welcome. some time to be with me today. Would you just bow with us? And we are just going to pray um, today in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for our time together. And Lord, together we express our grief and our sorrow for how, even after 400 years, there is still so much pain. There is so much racial tension that exists in this country. But Father, it is a reminder, and Dee said it, it is the evil that is within the heart of man. And that evil can only be eradicated by the blood of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. our Lord and our Savior. I thank you, Father, for what you've done here in Bethel, for the testimony that we have been to our community. I remember just this past year, an assemblyman came and visited here at Bethel. And when, he, when the service is over, he came to me and he said, I have never been in such a diverse congregation. What did you do? And I just looked at him and said, it is the work of the Lord. And it is the unifying power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we just pray for our nation. Mm -hmm. We pray for our leaders yeah. that out of this painful moment, that there would be a humility that comes upon all of the experts, that they would fall upon their knees and they would recognize that the racial healing we long for can only be found in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I pray that you would keep us unified, that your name would be exalted and lifted up. May we all learn from this simple conversation that there is much to gain in just listening, in asking questions, and that is going to help us as we move forward. May your name be glorified in this all, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. amen. God bless you. Love amen. you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. God bless you all. Thanks for being with us today. In Jesus' name.